This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, so off to the next session. This is going to be a blockbuster. Uh, so the session is titled Completing Darwin's Quest, Discovering the Dark Matter of Biology, and it could not be more appropriately named. And this session, you're going to hear two speakers, both superstars in their own right, in their own fields, but also at UC San Diego, uh, Dr. Larry Smar and Dr. Rob Knight, uh, one more senior than the other. I won't tell you who's who. You'll figure it out when you look at them, when you see them. Okay. Larry Smar, my good friend, is an astrophysicist turned computer scientist. And you may recognize his name because he's routinely coded in the New York Times, Washington Post, and just about every uh, newspaper and magazine you can think about. And, oh, I forgot to bring my newspaper. And I had kept it all the time. And literally yesterday, he was on the front page of Washington Post. I was in Washington having my morning cup of coffee, and I opened the newspaper, and what do I see? I see Larry Smart, and immediately I'm looking, does it say UC San Diego? And it did. It said, it said you know, that's what a chancellor is paid to do. So it said that three or four times, uh, but Larry Smart is an amazing person. He is the founding director of the California Institute for Tele Telecommunications and Information Technology, a UC San Diego and UC Irvine partnership, which at UC San Diego is now called the Qualcomm Institute, the Dr. Jacobs talked about. Uh, last year, uh, as part of our push into big data and vertically integrating discovery with, uh, through big data with healthcare, I asked Larry to lead a visionary initiative, not on, uh, on in, in big data, not only integrating our campus and connecting it uh, through very high speed links, but also understanding our big data strategy and where we are headed. And Larry has made a transformational impact right there. Something you may not know about Larry, in fact, I did not know until I read this, is he likes snorkeling, uh, but he also likes to grow orchids. But most of all, that I knew very well, which is the uh, topic of this article, Larry measures just about anything and everything in his body. And I think in his talk, he will tell you all the stuff he's measuring and the insight that it has uh, created. And it is changing medicine, believe it or not. Larry's single-handed experiment on his, on his own body is changing medicine in ways that one would not have imagined. The next person is going to be Dr. Rob Knight. We just hired him earlier this year, and he came amongst great fanfare. And when we did announce his appointment, we got calls from all over the country saying, how did you afford to hire him? It was not how did you manage to hire him, how did you afford to hire him? And I can tell you, were it not for the great philanthropy and this great community that has supported us unquestioned, un without a question, we would not be able to have somebody like Larry on our faculty. And he's a world leader in the study of the microbiome, a, literally a new area, and you'll hear something very, very cool things about it. And he was leader to lead the UC San Diego's uh, microbiome initiative. Uh, he's played a key role in the Human Microbiome Project, which has brought together a global network of more than 1,000 collaborators. And he says that he came to San Diego, or UC San Diego, because of the strengths of our disciplines, like high performance computing and immunology, and also our location. Uh, and being in the center of the biotech industry with our stellar partner institutions surrounding the campus, the ones we have just talked about, Rob says UC San Diego and this community is poised to be the world leading center for microbiome research in the next two quarters. So with that said, with that said, Larry Smar, please. Well, thanks very much, Pradeep, and uh, it's wonderful to be here. Welcome to everybody. Uh, Rob and I are going to tag team uh, to this talk, and I'm going to start off with how did an astrophysicist get into doing quantitative medicine? Um, a long, long time ago, uh, when I was doing my PhD, uh, I worked on uh, using the most advanced uh, high-performance computers 
to solve Einstein's equations for general relativity for the dynamical events that go on in the universe, like colliding black holes, generating gravitational waves. Uh, Rob told me that uh, I ought to come up with a higher resolution version of this. But remember, this is 40 years ago. And the fact that you could do yellow, and this had to be done in, in, in the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the nuclear weapons labs were the only place you had these supercomputers. The fact you could actually get yellow as a color was considered almost a state secret. But anyway, the point is that those supercomputers, because of Moore's law, are way slower than this phone. Now, I don't know what you're doing, angry birds or something? <laughs> I was solving Einstein's equations. But the key thing is this wave that we'll see again indicates that a nonlinear dynamic system generates oscillations. And we'll come back to that. Now, I was also uh, learning about cosmology. My first course in cosmology was 1969. At that time, we thought everything you could see was what the universe was made of. This is a Hubble deep uh, space image a deep field image, and each of those dots is a galaxy uh, with 100 billion stars. And um, yet, it turns out that we've learned that all that visible matter, the stars and galaxies, are only 4% of the mass energy of the universe. The rest, we don't know what it's made of. But we now have instruments like the Large Hadron Collider that's starting its second run, run two, that are its main focus after discovering the Higgs Find out what the dark matter is. And so scientific instruments are now being applied to what is overwhelmingly there, but we couldn't see. By the way, you'll recognize I'm setting up a metaphor. We'll come back to this uh, when we get to the microbiome. Now, I also did uh, X-ray observational and radio observing on the Andromeda galaxy. This is our neighbor galaxy, very like uh, our own Milky Way. 100 billion stars. I mean, I thought this was like about as complicated as you can get. And in fact, there are 100 billion of these galaxies. And that's why we think about big data, you first think of astronomy. It's got to be the queen of big data. Well, let's examine that hypothesis. This you'll all recognize. I remember it very well. Christmas Eve, 1968, Apollo uh, 8 was uh, uh, circling the moon, and for the first time, you had Earth rise. And when you look at the difference between the lifeless moon and this beautiful living planet that we're on, the difference is the microbes. The, almost all life on this planet is invisible. And in fact, if you add up all the cells of microbes, there are 100 million microbes for every star in the universe. Remember those 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars? Multiply those together. Now multiply times 100 million, and you have the number of microbial cells on this planet. And that, those microbes were the highest form of life for 3 billion years on the planet. They oxygenated the atmosphere. They established the food web in the ocean. And they transformed, literally, our planet from a lifeless planet to one that could support multicellular life. This is why microbiology is actually the biggest big data science. And in fact, uh, one of the advisors to the Human Microbiome Project in Nature uh, made this statement, which at the time, I have to say, I felt a little bit injured by. Uh, <laughs> but as I worked with more people like Rob Knight, I realized how truthful it is. Now, how do we discover this invisible life, OK? That's where we are right now. We're on the, on the verge of discovering this. Well, let's go back to uh, the 1800s, Darwin, who did these voyages around the world, and in particular to the Galapagos Islands, where Rob and I have both made pilgrimages because of the birthplace, really, of, of our modern thought of evolution, which is the core of, of, of biology. And, and what we find is that if you go to the origin of species in 1859, uh, there's 502 pages and only one figure. But that figure is perhaps the most important figure in the history of biology, because the idea of the tree of life, the evolution of species, is uh, at the heart of everything that we now do in biology. 
So I'm going to take that and let's understand that the way he got it was by observing what was out there in the way of differences among species, and in particular the famous finches, which you can see once he got back to England, unpacked all these things, worked with ornithologists, realized had to have evolved by isolation on these islands in the Galapagos from a single uh, seed-eating ground finch. Well, uh, he reasoned that this had to be the same for all animals. And so today, we now have the tree of life of all the animals, from you know, clams to sea shards to mammals, us, uh, et cetera. Everything uh, is, that we think of when we think of biodiversity. But what we've learned is if you then look at the actual, use DNA to look at the genomes, all of those animals are one little twig on the genetic diversity. And this tree is measuring the distance between uh, the DNA, how different the DNA is of living creatures. And you know, we're basically sitting between slime moles and fungi. So you know, basically, if you can't tell the difference between yourself and a slime mole, uh, you know, that, that's nothing compared to uh, the microbiome. And, and, and many of these are inside of you, almost all these microbes, and we'll come back and discover that. Now, how do we explore that, um, uh, that world? Because, you know, you can't see it. Well, we couldn't. The microscope was all we had for 150 years of microbiology until being able to sequence DNA. And what you'll see here from the NIH is that's a log scale vertically. And so in the last um, 10 years, we've had a 10,000-fold reduction in the cost of doing this. That means we now are just crossing the threshold where we can explore essentially all the life on Earth. And that's what Craig Venter, who you will meet with later, he did this epic around the world uh, uh, trip with his uh, yacht, the Sorcerer Two, and had this brilliant idea of sampling the ocean water and then sequencing it. And he found out that there was vast amounts of unknown life in the oceans. And more importantly, the genes that were in those DNA of those bacteria were unknown and had tremendous potential. And we're just beginning to unfold that. Uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation funded the sequencing. And then they came to me and they said, Larry, would you be willing to uh, get a grant from the Moore Foundation to build a global repository for all of this environmental microbes? Um, and these are the people who've used that repository. I built a supercomputer just to look at the uh, data that was coming from the gene sequencing of, uh, of, of microbes uh, throughout the world. Uh, and, and that ended up with looking at um, probably 6,000 users, 2,000 samples, uh, 75 countries uh, that were able to do it. Well, then that was uh, uh, followed by the Earth uh, Microbiome Project, which Rob is one of the uh, founders of, has now looked at 30,000 environmental uh, samples on the Earth, uh, again, initiated by the Department of Energy at Argonne but sustained by foundations like the ones you're associated with. Uh, and so uh, fundamentally, we wouldn't be able to be giving this talk had it not been for the support of foundations, uh, as well as the federal agency, but instrumentally, the foundation. So Rob? Thanks. Thanks, Larry. And um, it's a true privilege to be here, both in the sense of in this room and uh, at this university. Um, there were certainly a lot of institutions that were willing to offer more money to move there, but what they couldn't offer was the unique combination of uh, the, the intellectual environment, uh, the integration of, the, of, of uh, basic sciences with medicine, with engineering, uh, even with things like oceanography, which, as you see, are increasingly um, important, um, important to human health. And, um, and especially the links to, to industry, links to philanthropy, and the kind of environment where you can um, not just do amazing science, but have fun doing that science. So uh, my background's in evolutionary biology and biochemistry, although, uh, to be quite honest, I don't do so much of this anymore. Uh, I have an expanding army of robots to, uh, to do that for me, and um, I think it's many people's dream when they get into science to one day uh, have control of an army of robots. But uh, one, one thing, one, but one, one thing our, our robots can't do yet is uh, go out and, uh, and collect the samples for us. So everything from your backyard 
looking at the dog microbiome uh, to zoos, looking at Komodo dragons. This is a little baby Komodo dragon um, called, uh, called, called Bintang. Um, to, uh, uh, to collecting samples from um, hunter-gatherers in Tanzania uh, and, um, and to work with malnourished children uh, in Bangladesh. And a lot of this has been supported through, uh, through private foundations, uh, through the Earth Microbiome Project and then, um, and then other projects. So, uh, so, so it's, really, it's really been very exciting as a combination of work. And um, our microbes have uh, our, our, our microbes are deeply connected to the microbes out there in the environment. So, um, so my partner Amanda uh, took this photo when we were in Peru a few years ago. What you can see is that this is a bathroom. Uh, this is someone washing their clothes, and this is someone washing their dishes right downstream from that bathroom. And so we're connected to our uh, to connected to our microbes in all kinds of ways that we don't like to think about. But nonetheless, those ways can be very important. Um, and our own bathrooms aren't that pristine either. So uh, this is some work we did uh, in Boulder with Noah Ferra in the Ecology and Evolution Department there. And so what we were doing is we were doing the biogeography of the restroom. And so we can, uh, we can track the sources of bacteria in different places. Uh, you can see the skin bacteria are mainly on things you touch, like the door handles, the faucets, uh, the toilet seat, which obviously you're touching with a different part of your skin. Um, the stool microbes primarily in the bathroom stall, so that was kind of reassuring. But then we found microbes from the dirt on the floor and also on the flush handle, where apparently a lot of people were using their feet to flush. And coming from New Zealand, I had never heard of this practice, but apparently it's very <laughs> common in the US, and, uh, and, and your microbes reveal that behavior. But that's not all of the behavior the microbes we exchange with our environment reveal. So uh, another thing we looked at was computer equipment. And just like, you uh, just like you leave traces of your human DNA on everything you touch, uh, the same is true for your microbial DNA. And so we could show that we could link your fingertips up to the keyboard you, you type on and the palm of your hand up to the computer mouse you use with up to 95% accuracy. Uh, so this came out in the scientific journal PNES a few years ago. But more importantly, it was on CSI Miami, so you really know it's true. <laughs> and, um, and, and in fact, we can track these microbial exposures over time. Um, so uh, one, one thing that's interesting is that in urban air, at street level, so this is what you're breathing in, there's three approximately equal sources of microbes in the summer, uh, the leaf surfaces, the soil, and, um, and, uh, and, and then other material. But um, regrettably, uh, so this is in the Midwest, uh, we, we did the study, and regrettably, uh, especially in Cleveland and Detroit, in the winter, there's no leaves on the trees, and, um, and, and the soil's all frozen, so it's not volatile. And unfortunately, the major source of microbes left over uh, is dog feces. So, um, uh, so that's what you're breathing in in the cities. Uh, it's certainly much better to be breathing in the ocean, um, as uh, Kim, uh, Kim Prather will talk to you about this, uh, the, this afternoon. Um, and so uh, one, one thing we can do is that because all these microbes are uh, integrated over this one tree of life, we can, use Darwin's, uh, we can use Darwin's vision to place microbes from any community all over the planet onto this one phylogenetic tree and understand how they relate to one another. And so when we do this, uh, when we look at uh, communities from all over the world, including extremes of temperature, extremes of pH, just about any other factor uh, you can imagine, what turns out to be most important is something very surprising. Uh, it turns out to be salinity, and this is, a, this, is, this is a map of the microbes in different parts of the Earth in an abstract space derived by something called uh, principal coordinates analysis for the aficionados. We see this deep split between the saline and the non-saline communities. There's a few estuaries in blue in the middle, uh, which really are intermediate between the saline and the non-saline environments. So the ocean is really important as a distinct source of microbes. And uh, for example, temperature just isn't important on this graph. When we look at hot environments, they just integrate with the rest. But with some additional work, um, we were able to find some environments that are really extreme from the microbial perspective. And when we add them to the graph, what they do is they squash up everything from all over the Earth into just this one little side of the graph. Um, and they're more different from anything we saw anywhere on the planet. So you might wonder, where do you have to go to find these extreme environments, uh, the top of a mountain, the bottom of an ocean, or, or where? And the answer is remarkable. The answer is that they're right there within us, uh, in our gut. And these gut communities are, uh, are very distinct from each other and very distinct from all of those environmental samples. So, um, uh, and, um, and, and so uh, Bill Gerwick and Brad Moore are going to talk more about this distinction um, and also the relationships between marine uh, microbes and marine chemicals in human health. 
So, um, so a lot of the reason for all of this excitement about the microbiome is that it's almost like uh, we've, we've discovered this forgotten organ that weighs about as much as your gut. Well, not really as much as your gut, um, because you know, the total mass of your intestines is a lot heavier. But rather, the microbes your gut contains uh, consist of about, uh, about three pounds of material, um, all bacteria. So that weighs about the same as your brain and contains more genes, more cells, and arguably more complexity uh, than your brain and perhaps the rest of your body. And, um, and what's remarkable is how rapidly this has proceeded from the research literature, uh, so, so from the cover, cover of science uh, to the cover of The Economist in just a few months. And so in the NIH-funded Human Microbiome Project, we spent $173 million collecting reference data uh, for, the, for what the human microbiome looked like, so collecting 4.5 trillion A's, T's, G's, and C's that we then had to make some kind of sense of. Um, and so this is really like the equivalent of uh, the Large Hadron Collider that Larry mentioned, uh, discovering the dark matter of our microbiome. Uh, uh, largely, I have to be honest, discovering that dark matter in a place where the sun proverbially does not shine. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it turns out that the human microbiota consists of up to 100 trillion microbial cells. Um, in comparison, we're estimated to have about 10 trillion human cells. And then um, our microbiome arranges from 2 to 20 million genes versus the 20,000 human genes we have in the genome. And so by this measure, you're only about 1% human, 99% microbial. Um, and so using tools I developed in my lab for visualization, uh, here's a map of all those thousands of samples we collected in the, uh, in the Human Microbiome Project, which I'd be happy to explain to anyone in more detail uh, afterwards. But essentially, you can see, um, so essentially, each point on this map represents all the microbes, all the complexity of the community, just boiled down to one point, represented by the DNA of that community. And you can see major patches of color in this map, almost like different microbial continents. And what those are are the different regions of the body, uh, the mouth in green, the skin in blue, uh, the vagina in pink, and the stool down the bottom in brown. And so what this implies is that different parts of the body have totally different microbes in them. And this turns out to be true. So if we highlight uh, one person's sample from their mouth and from their stool, those communities are very far apart on this map. So you might wonder, well, how far apart are those really? And what we can do is we can use all the data in the Earth Microbiome Project and the fact that all the communities map onto one tree of life to compare them to environmental samples. And when we do that, we find that the samples from the mouth and the gut of one person are exactly as far apart as the samples from this reef in Florida and the samples from this prairie in Nebraska, microbially. So just think about that for a moment. What it means is that a few feet along the length of your own body makes more of a difference to your microbial communities than hundreds of miles across the Earth's surface. So you might be wondering, well, how stable is our microbiome over time, um, at least if we're healthy? And to answer this question, my partner, Amanda, um, who's put up with a lot, of the, a lot on the name of the microbiome, and I uh, sampled ourselves um, every single day for six months uh, looking at the microbiome of our uh, mouth, our skin, and our stool, sampling them with Q-tips every morning. And so when I start this going, what you can see is, even within a person, just how tremendously variable the skin is, um, how, uh, how constant in comparison the mouth is, and how the stool is, is the kind of intermediate between the two. And you can also see how stable we are in terms of maintaining separate microbial identity, despite the fact that we live together and we have all kinds of opportunities to exchange microbes with one another, <laughs> right? And, um, and so you can also imagine how useful this could be for tracking development, for tracking disease, and all kinds of other states. And I'll just spin this around so that you can see uh, how, uh, how, how we maintain that microbial separation that leads to that identifiability of our microbial communities that I told you about on the keyboard. So there's two cases where this doesn't happen, uh, the this, this stability, uh, when we're young and when we're sick. And so Larry is going to tell you his own remarkable story about the second of those circumstances. Thanks, Rob. So I think the important point to notice is this is health, and it's stable. It stays in the same little location, even though it's a year uh, long. And so I... I never expected to be in this line of work. Um, you know, uh, I was being a good computer scientist and um, so on. But I did. A, I've, I've been doing big data for 40 years. It's all. I mean, it's exponentially bigger now. But I mean, it was always using supercomputers. It was the biggest data. In fact, when I did that yellow wave, that was a year before Rob was born. Um, <clears throat> anywho. Um, 
So I, 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 when I got to La Jolla uh, in 2000, I had been uh, living 20 years at the University of Illinois and, and Urbana-Champaign in the Midwest, the heart of the obesity epidemic. Uh, I had, uh, you know, I was overweight. I didn't exercise. Um, you know, there was, I was a normal American. <laughs> and, and I got here, and I looked around, and I realized I didn't look like everybody else, and they were going to send me back if I didn't get with the program. <clears throat> so I started learning about nutrition, and uh, got a trainer, started doing exercises. And to measure my uh, you know, progress, I got on the scale every morning, and I had one number defining my overall being, my weight. But as I changed my nutrition, and in particular started uh, de-inflaming uh, my food source by, by, by getting rid of most of the omega-6 long-chain fatty acids and getting omega-3s like from fish oil and things, um, <clears throat> I wondered how well I was doing, so I started taking blood tests, or having them go off to a lab to figure out um, did I need to change it, did I need to add supplements and so forth, and so I sort of started titrating my, my blood to figure that out because, you know, it's like I'm a scientist, so what else would you do? Um, and <laughs> And so I started before long, I had over 100 different things I was tracking in my blood and, and stool. So now there's 100 numbers defining me. Uh, and then um, I uh, uh, started, I was an early adopter of 23andMe, so with a little spit in the tube, I could get a million points along my human DNA where 90% of the differences between all of us live, and I could analyze that. And then I'm now doing the microbiome with Rob, and I've got a billion numbers, which, by the way, change every time you eat something. And so imagine now a medical record with a million, a billion entries in it, right? Now, this actual feedback of moment-to-moment -moment time series, so how many of you have a Fitbit or, or something like that that are currently tracking you know, yourself, like my Fitbit? And, and you can see you know, by the minute uh, how you're how many steps you're doing and so forth. And I basically quadrupled my steps up to eight or 10,000 steps, four or five miles a day. I started using my elliptical, measuring my heart rate to actually drive the strength of the elliptical so I could do intervals. Um, that cardio training drove my resting heart rate from 70 down to 40. Uh, so, which is like marathoners or something uh, without doing marathons. And uh, so I thought, this is great. I'm getting healthier and healthier. And yet, what I discovered as I continued is something that I actually never expected to find. So here over at uh, Qualcomm Institute uh, in Cal IT2 uh, is this 64 million pixel wall. And each of these charts is, over the last 12 years, uh, one of these 100 different things that I tracked in my blood or, or stool. Um, and the ones that are green are all fine. They're in the healthy zone. The ones that are yellow mean that the average is one to 10 times above the healthy normal. And the red means you're 10 to 100 times above the healthy normal. Um, and this is the way I gather data. Um, once every th quarter, I give 13 vials of blood. Every month, I just give a few. Uh, and then I do stool samples now every two weeks. Well, what I found was out of just one of those variables, this is uh, called CRP. Many of you get it when you go to the doctor. It's your measure of overall inflammation. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather when I found out that instead of less than one, which is healthy, uh, back all the way here in 2006, I was five, then 10, then 15. There was a source of inflammation in my body. And I would go into the doctor and, and say, look, something terrible is going on inside of me. And they said, really? Well, how do you feel? And I said, well, fine. And, and they said, well, why are you wasting my time? I'm a doctor. And I said, well, because I have data. And they said, well, that's, <laughs> that's not useful. Uh, that's academic, you know? And in fact, it got up as high as 27 times. Just to put in perspective, if your, H, if your CRP is five, that quadruples your future chance of, of heart disease. So uh, furthermore, I saw this oscillation. I said, where have I seen that before, right? Uh, from the dynamic systems I studied in astrophysics. But then I said, well, I realized the same company would allow me to do stool samples that would give me uh, information on my immune system because your large intestine, your colon, is your largest immune organ in your body. And so as, if it's in a war, that, the debris of the war carries out into the stool. And you can see here that I got up to 124 times the upper limit for healthy. And when you look into the scientific literature, 
Um, that is typical of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, which is one of 80 autoimmune diseases that the NIH recognizes. So um, at this time, we were fortunate enough that, that Bill Sanborn, who was uh, a doctor for 20 years at the Mayo Clinic, uh, we recruited to come to UC San Diego to set up the head of GI. And I cold called him, and well, David Brenner actually helped introduce me. But I said, hi, I need to be uh, your patient, and you need to be my doctor. And he said, like, this is a crank call. Um, <laughs> we're now co-authoring papers together on my body. But, um, but you'll notice this oscillation going on. Now, there's nothing like this in the scientific literature, oddly enough, because they don't believe in taking time series. Um, and so, and furthermore, I have every day since 2009, uh, anything that went wrong with my body, I have a symptom diary. And, and originally, when I was discovering these peaks, I didn't have any symptoms. But then later on, as it really, you know, the immune system, this is one subcomponent of your immune system, lactoferrin, uh, it uh, became pretty clear. Um, so uh, Sanborn suggested, well, let's get an MRI of you. And here's the typical thing that you see from the slices. There's your liver at the top, your transverse colon, all those uh, things down there, the small intestine. And then this funny little thing uh, that didn't look quite right. Well, as soon as I got out of the tube, of course, what did I say? Thank you very much. Now give me the data. And then I brought the data back because we had one of the best uh, virtual reality groups in the, in the world. So I gave them my data. And after all, it was a 3D thing. So then they turned it into a fly-through sort of video game. In fact, I give people tours of the inside of my body and our <laughs> <laughs> virtual reality. Uh, and you'll see this sort of funny um, kink uh, that comes down. It's a little hard to see. So what I said was, don't we have one of those 3D printer things? And so here's my colon. <laughs> um, this is sort of it's like here. So this is the disease part. This is this, the swollen part here. And you might like <laughs> pass it around, you know. Um, so um, uh, anyway, um, you can pass it around. It, it's it's harmful, harmless. <laughs> but you know, you can actually look in 3D at the outside of the colon, and what, what you can see is I've got diverticula, like many people do my age, and so on. But if you cross section it. Again, with the with, uh, computer, you see that it's very thick walled. It's, it's five times as thick as it should be, and that's an indication that not only you have IBD, but you have Crohn's. Okay, so I said, what can this be? I mean, I, I clearly have some sort of dynamical system inside me, so what's the other side of the immune system? And of course, that's the microbiome and those 100 trillion cells that are in your gut. So uh, I uh, started working on that because the human, microbi human microbiome program had just been completed in, in, in 2012, you saw published, I was able to download over the internet all of the 255 healthy people's microbiome, added in, uh, I got the Venner Institute uh, to sequence seven times over a year and a half my stool so I could get my microbiome, and then we had a few IBD patients that we had microbiomes of. I was fortunate enough to uh, actually, Mike Norman had been working with me at Livermore, you know, 30 some odd years ago, said, Mike, I need a little time, you know? So anyway, 25 CPU years later, uh, that's like your, car, your computer running 24 seven for 25 years to compute this on seven trillion DNA bases. I was able to actually then make a map like Rob's been showing you where the healthy people are in blue. Now remember what this is, a little swipe of stool, right? Now that stool has a billion microbes per gram, and those each have several million bases of DNA per bug. And, and so when you look at that, you see that the healthy are completely disjoint from where ulcerative colitis is, my colonic Crohn's in the, in the large intestine, and ileal Crohn's, which is a much worse form of Crohn's in the end of the small intestine where the ileum is. So think about this. This is a microbial ecology diagnostic. Now, this is a hypothesis. We have got to now uh, test this by many more examples, but fortunately, Bill Sanborn has set up a biobank here at UC San Diego, has several hundred IBD patients in. So what Rob and I are gonna be doing is sequencing that later, so we get the resources to do that. 
What does my dynamics look like? You saw Rob, he was stable. Well, think of this as a map where healthy, the blue guys are on the left and sick is on the right. And here are my seven time samples. But what's a time ordering? Well, notice that in the first half year or so, I was sort of in one little equilibrium and then I shoot across to very much more unhealthy and then back toward healthy and then I'm staying there. So that is not stable. That's highly unstable and that is what it means to have a disease. That, that if you have one of these autoimmune diseases, your microbiome is way out of whack. And yet we haven't been able to measure any of that until just now and it's just beginning to be possible. So um, I just wanted to share with you, this was literally from last week on the wall. This is me over the last, since October of uh, 2010. So this is like uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. The top are those oscillating immune variables. The, below, each of those uh, width of these little bars is one week. And these, these are four, I won't tell you what all these are, but they're symptoms, different kinds of symptoms, including emotional, like this is malaise and depression, uh, this is flaring and so forth, this is bleeding. Anyway, the point is, um, then the, the, you can tell the intensity by the intensity of color, and if it's blank, there's no symptom that week. So, so this is what the doctor you know, asks you, how are you feeling? This is what you really are. And the question is, can you go from here to here? Not very easily. And, and then here are the pharmaceuticals that I was on. This was... Uh, uh, a month of taking two heavy-duty uh, antibiotics every day for a month and two months of prednisone. And then you're going to be able to tell, well, what happened? Well, these purple lines are now the stool samples that I've carefully taken and frozen at 80 below zero uh, that are going to give us the microbiome for the first time across all this along with those 100 different uh, things that are going in my body. In other words, I've turned my body into a genetic observatory. Uh, I've sort of given my body to science, but it's sort of a renting thing because I want to keep using my body while... Um, <laughs> so, so, so last week was one of the most exciting days in my life and in years because I was finally able to have someone with Rob Knight being here that I could give my stool to. <laughs> and so I, I went down to Hillcrest where I... The, uh, medical center downtown where, where I'd been carefully storing all this in freezers, uh, got out a vial of each of those dates, put it on dry ice, and brought it up and presented it to Rob. Um, and so, uh, and we're now going to, you're going to hear from Kelly Fraser about our, our core genomic facility. That's where we're going to be sequencing this uh, over the next uh, uh, short time. Uh, and then we're going to put me on the map over those 40 different times. And for the first time, we're really gonna get an understanding of how this disease works. Because once we understand what is going on, because we didn't know before the microbe side of it, now you have a, a tremendously different opportunity in terms of therapy. Rob? Uh, thanks, Larry. And as, as Larry says, it's uh, a tremendously exciting opportunity to uh, be able to be able to take Larry's data that's been so carefully collected and well quantified and integrate it into the microbial map uh, supported by things like the Human Microbiome Project and also things like American Gut, uh, which, uh, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, uh, of course, inspired, uh, in, inspired by people like Larry and uh, Mike Snyder at Stanford, and others, um, uh, I, I've, uh, I, I didn't actually stop at the end of that six-month time series, and I've continued to collect samples uh, uh, every every day since then, nearly six years later. Uh, I, I guess I guess I won't ask Anne to uh, pass around this morning's sample because, uh, unlike Larry's gut, which you can just print out another copy of, I can't replace this. But the value of these long-term observations of our own bodies are, are just truly irreplaceable, but also very difficult to support in a uh, traditional research funding context. So, um, so, well, so I'll talk a little bit more about disease, not just inflammatory bowel disease, but other, uh, other, other diseases as well with a microbial component a little bit later. Um, but at this point, you might be wondering, um, well, where do our microbes come from in the first place? And if you have dogs or kids as I do, you likely have some dark suspicions about that, all of which are true, by the way. So just like I can match you up to your keyboard by the microbes you share, I can also match you up to your dog by the microbes you share. 
But don't worry, uh, most of it's beneficial. Um, early life exposure to dogs has a beneficial effect on things like um, atopic disease, uh, asthma, allergies, and so forth. So many of these exposures to microbes are good rather than bad. Um, so in all seriousness, how we're born makes a tremendous difference to babies' first microbes. And so uh, if we come out the regular way, uh, all of our microbes look more or less the same, um, unlike the highly differentiated microbial communities we see in adults. So these pink dots are, um, are from all over the body of babies, uh, vaginally born, sampled 20 minutes after birth, integrated with their mothers, um, sampled an hour before birth. So these are their vaginal communities. Whereas in contrast, um, my, uh, babies delivered by C-section have uh, microbes that look just like the skin communities of their mother. And so this deprivation of this microbial birthright that you would normally get passing through the birth canal may explain some of the differences between C-section and vaginally delivered babies in terms of their health, in terms of asthma, allergies, atopic disease, even obesity, all of which have now been linked to the microbiome. And so, for example, when my own daughter was born by unplanned C-section, uh, we took matters into our own hands and made sure that she got those microbes that she would have had naturally um, as soon as the hospital staff were out of the room because they were not into this at all. <laughs> uh, but our dollar was very enthusiastic. Um, so we can also expand this to, uh, to the rest of the global population. And so this is work we did with Jeff Gordon, um, who, uh, who I collaborated on much of the work I'm going to show you now on. Well, what we're looking at is development of the infant microbiome over, over the first three years where it uh, reaches the adult state, um, essentially in that time, whether you're from Africa in red, South America in green, or the US in blue. And so this almost allows us to define like a microbial growth chart, the equivalent of the kinds of height and weight growth charts that you've seen at the pediatrician's office. So this might lead you to wonder, uh, what happens if we just look at one infant? Uh, how does that progression work? So this is the work we did with Ruth Lay, now at Cornell, uh, tracking the progression of one infant, um, her own. Uh, so this baby boy, uh, we're going to see how his gut microbiome develops over the first two and a half years of life. And so the question is, is it a smooth progression towards the adult stool state? Um, is it uh, how, how far does he get in those two and a half years? Um, and uh, you can see that, uh, and so each frame in this is going to be one week in his developing microbiome. Um, and you can see he initially starts off in the vaginal region, which we'd expect from his delivery mode. And so what you can see is that sometimes he's fairly stable week to week, but other times he changes a lot and he looks like a completely different person. The change in this one infant's gut microbes one week to the next can be bigger than the differences between any two adults that we saw in the entire human microbiome project. And coming up here in a moment is just fascinating. He's about to get antibiotics for, uh, for an ear infection. What you see is this tremendous regression of the microbiome, followed by a relatively rapid recovery. So that went by pretty fast. I'll just rewind that for you so you can see it again. Uh, what we see is that oral antibiotics change his gut microbiome uh, radically, undoing months of healthy, normal development. Um, but in this case, he's tremendously resilient. And by the time he gets up to two and a half years of life, uh, he winds up more or less in the healthy adult state, uh, like, you saw, uh, like you saw in the kids cross-culturally uh, um, cross on the last slide. So, um, so this raises all kinds of questions about the effects that our, um, our modern practices are having on our microbes. So over the, last, uh, over the last 50 years or so, we've become amazingly good at controlling infectious diseases, everything from measles to, uh, to tuberculosis. But at the same time, all kinds of complex autoimmune diseases, including Crohn's disease, MS, type 1 diabetes, and asthma have been exploded. And so, uh, have been exploding. And so, um, one possibility uh, raised by Marty Blazer, one of my colleagues uh, at, at NYU, is that this might literally be uh, due to deprivation of exposure to beneficial microbes, just in the same way that nutritional deficiencies caused a whole range of diseases, um, scurvy, pellagra, uh, uh, beriberi, and so forth, at the start of the last century, um, uh, sorry, at the, at the start of the 1900s, all of which have been eliminated by subsequent research, um, uh, subsequent research into, uh, into nutrition. So, uh, so the question is, has, uh, has controlling these single pathogen species has effectively led to a silent spring going on right there within us? And in this respect, it's been fascinating to study the microbiomes of hunter-gatherers. Um, so this was a study with Marty where uh, previously uncontacted hunter-gatherers in the Yanomami in South America have totally different microbiomes, even from relatively acculturated genetic uh, relatives of them. And this is true for other populations like the Hadza. Uh, so I was with Marty in Tanzania uh, last year, in the shadow of Kilimanjaro, 
uh, where, where I met a man who, um, who, who had the week before shot a giraffe uh, with a bow and arrow that he made himself, and then traded the skin and the meat to the Datahoga, uh, the next group over, for a cell phone. And he keeps the minutes topped up uh, with, with honey that he gathers uh, so that he can keep it charged, uh, keep it topped up with minutes. And so these Western practices are really, uh, are really penetrating the entire world, and their plagues are becoming our plagues. And in this context, it's sobering to remember that the entire human microbiome project is missing all this diversity that we see as soon as we go into other populations and as soon as we look at children rather than adults, um, which are, uh, because as I showed you, uh, the child microbiome is also totally different from the adult microbiome. Um, so you might be wondering, uh, does all this diversity in the microbiome actually matter? And so uh, one situation in which your microbiome degrades into a very low diversity situation is during obesity. And, and in fact, today, I can tell you with 90% accuracy, solely based on your gut microbes, whether you're lean or obese. So on the one hand, that's kind of a cool trick. On the other hand, we don't think it has a lot of commercial potential as a diagnostic test, right? Because I bet you can tell which of these people is obese without uh, knowing anything about their microbiomes at all. But if I try to do that same classification task based on human DNA, I can only do it with 58% accuracy based on your genome versus 90% accuracy based on your microbiome. Mm -hmm because all of those microbial genes that we carry around with us have a tremendous impact. And that's, not, uh, that's true not just for obesity, but also for things like, uh, that you might expect, like irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease, uh, things you might expect less, like atherosclerosis and colon cancer, and things that you might be really surprised by, including rheumatoid arthritis, and if you're a mouse, uh, even things like, uh, like, like depression and autism, where the mouse model data is very, very compelling for microbial involvement. Um, of course, if you're a mouse, we can do a lot more experimentally, which is why we know more about mice. And uh, what we can do is we can, um, we can even cross the species barrier by taking uh, microbes from human samples and then putting them into mice that have been raised in a bubble, germ-free, without any microbes of their own, and see how they respond. Uh, so when we do this in the case of obesity, if you take these germ-free mice and you give them the microbes from an obese person, uh, they become obese themselves, but not if you give them the microbes from a lean person. And the fascinating thing is, again, with Jeff Gordon's group at WashU, we can design a microbial community to inoculate them with that prevents them from gaining this weight. Um, so this was NIH-funded, but we also have a Gates-funded program on, uh, on malnutrition. And you can take a kid with quashia core, a profound uh, form of malnutrition, and if you take that child with quash, uh, a stool sample uh, shipped frozen, um, in this case from Malawi, and transplanted into a germ-free mouse, that mouse does very badly. It loses 30% of its body weight in just three weeks, and it dies if it's left untreated. But we can rescue it with the same peanut butter-based supplement that we, use, uh, that we use with the kids in the clinic. And so you can essentially pilot these individualized uh, nutritional therapies in germ-free mice uh, and see what would, what would work for the individual. So uh, given this information, a lot of people, uh, like Larry and like myself, have wondered, uh, how can I place myself on the microbial map? And traditionally, it's just been too expensive to do it uh, and too difficult. So for example, in the Human Microbiome Project, all of the, all of the clinical sampling was done at WashU and at Baylor. And uh, additionally, all of the, um, you, you had to be rigorously screened at healthy at every site on your body. So essentially, it wound up being a study of 25-year-old medical students, which, while a fascinating population, you might, nece you might not necessarily want them to represent all of humanity. So a couple of years ago, uh, I launched this project called American Gut that exploits the decline in the cost of sequencing to allow anyone to place themselves on the map. And we've just recently got uh, IRB approval to transfer this project to uh, UC San Diego. And so um, essentially, it's, uh, essentially it's largely donor supported by members of the public. Uh, at this point, we've raised over a million dollars, uh, sent out over 9,000 kits, uh, uh, sequenced over 4,500 samples, and made this a free, open data resource for any educator, any researcher, anyone at a company to just see what a huge number of microbiomes looks like. And we also have a framework in place to, use, uh, to build on this to do other projects targeted at specific diseases and specific populations, uh, supported by philanthropy for those who are unable to, uh, to uh, support the costs of their own sequencing. Um, of course, not everyone wants to know what's, uh, what's in there. So uh, this is what happens when we give tours of our lab and explain to middle schoolers that what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, lasers and robots to, uh, to, to look at their microbiomes. Um, 
But uh, there's one compelling reason why you might be interested, uh, and that, uh, the, most, the best example we have that I'll just show you briefly is uh, C. diff-associated disease. So C. diff is a terrible kind of diarrhea where it doesn't just change your own community, uh, change, change your, um, your gut community by the addition of that one organism. It causes a profound transformation of your gut microbiome after antibiotics, sort of like weeds growing back after a wildfire. And so uh, if, if I show you where people with C. diff are on this map, you can see that they have totally different stool microbiomes from anyone we saw in the Human Microbiome Project. Um, so what's going to happen is that uh, four of these patients are going to get a fecal transplant uh, from one donor. And we did this with uh, researchers at the University of Minnesota, but it's also being done right here. And to give you an uh, idea of how rapidly the field is changing, um, when Larry asked Bill Sanborn uh, to do this four years ago, he told him, we will never do this uh, at, at the UC San Diego Hospital. But four years later, uh, um, here's, here's Bill uh, about to give a stool transplant. And, uh, the reason, and the reason why is that it's, it's remarkable remarkably effective. So how effective is it? Well, um, the people enrolled in this trial uh, are so sick, and re uh, so they're going to the bathroom a couple of dozen times a day, and C. diff-associated uh, infection kills 14,000 people a year in the US alone. And so four of them are going to get a transplant from this one donor. But unlike the infant time series I showed you, here each frame is going to be just one day uh, in their microbiome as it transforms. And what you can see is, essentially, immediately, they go to the healthy state uh, just within a couple of days. They stay there for the few months of follow-up, and they remain healthy uh, during this entire time. Like their symptoms, uh, their symptoms clear up immediately. And the last major uh, initiative comparing, um, uh, comparing fecal transplant to antibiotics for C. diff had to be stopped early because it was almost 95% effective for fecal transplant, but only about 30% effective for antibiotics. And it was con considered unethical to continue withholding the fecal transplant from the people on the antibiotic arm of the trial who could benefit from it. So the question, uh, and really the challenge that we have to face, uh, is for how many um, patients with other diseases now linked to the microbiome, uh, including everything from Crohn's disease uh, to, to obesity, and if the mouse model is translatable to humans, even things like depression and autism, can we identify a dysbiotic state? And then either uh, through fecal transplantation or for other therapies, including the new antibiotics um, that, that you'll hear about from SIO, and the new uh, immunotherapies that Rizal uh, Kirchrock will talk about primarily uh, associated with cancer, but also potentially applicable to the microbiome, <laughs> Uh, how will we be able to use all these different therapies together with probiotics, prebiotics, targeted antibiotics to guide you from an unhealthy to a healthy state? And so essentially what we have to do is we have to figure out uh, not just a microbial map, but a microbial GPS that tells you not just where are you right now, but where do you have to go and what do you have to do turn by turn to get there. And we need to develop it and make it so easy to use that even our children can use it. So you can imagine a future where we'll get these microbiome analyses done right there in our homes, uh, potentially on some kind of a smart toilet, uh, where, we'll be able to, uh, where, where we'll be able to do these kinds of uh, analyses immediately, deliver them to our smartphones, which remember, uh, Larry told you, are like a supercomputer from the 80s, and figure out whether we're going in a good or bad direction. So um, just to switch metaphors briefly, uh, it's almost like uh, we need to, instead of waging war on our microbes, we need to treat them like a microbial garden, where after devastation by antibiotics, if you just leave them alone, you'll get weeds running wild. And then the question is, should you plant the seeds of good microbes with probiotics, uh, feed them with prebiotics, or just lay down new turf with, bacteria, uh, with uh, fecal uh, microbial transplants um, and then get back into a healthy state? And so Larry is going to finish this by telling you how a remarkable $120 million gift from the Radies is enabling us to do this right here at UCSD. Thanks, Rob. Well, we're almost done. Uh, I just want to point out that how quickly this is changing. You'll notice that this individualized approach, which the NIH calls as precision medicine, was mentioned both by President Obama in the, in the State of the Union in January and then by Jerry Brown, who has his own uh, California project uh, in a few days later. But Newt Gingrich, who's you know, lifetime conservative, not so sure about the government, wants to once again, as he did in the 90s, double the NIH budget. Uh, so there just seems to be a moment here with all the bickering we normally have to move forward at the federal level. Um, and then the question is, how are we going to use this? How do we go from the sort of things, experiments we're doing to the medical records, which Lucilla uh, uh, Onomachada is going to give you more insight into? Well, fortunately here, we have, because of a donor, uh, Ernest and Evelyn Rady, they, uh, of course, named the Rady School with previous donations, but they've just given $120 million to set up a pediatric genomics 
and Systems Medicine Institute in the Rady School. Rob came here in the pediatrics department for a reason. So they're going to be working to see uh, how do we move this quickly into uh, the about most important period in human development, that first three years of life. Uh, and I think you're going to see that UC San Diego and, and the Rady School, all their doctors are part of the medical school here, are, are going to be at the uh, vanguard of this nationally. I wish I could spend time talking about what I do for a day job, which is drive cyber infrastructure, which I've done for 40 years. But I just want to show you, your, your home mo when you get internet at the home, you're about two megabits a second. So this is what we're setting up for uh, Rob's lab and also the other microbial researchers here on, on the campus, 10,000 megabits per second, linking the lab into the supercomputers. He's getting a thousand core uh, processor. Uh, the Radies Ch uh, Children's Hospital is going directly into this. You know, if you have like a, a stick that has like 16 gigabytes, you have a lot of data. Well. You know, we're set up for big data in a way that there's no other campus in, the universe, in, in this country that is. Um, so I just end with this statement I've made before. The big change is data. The big change is time series because that is what lets us understand the fundamental dynamics of our bodies. And if we can understand that, there's real hope. Thanks. Thank you.